Welcome to Santa Cruz Christian Fellowship's online Bible study for this Wednesday, May 18th. Thank you once again for taking time out of your schedule to join me in this Wednesday in the Word. Let's bow before the Lord as we begin. Father, thank you for this day that you've made. Lord, thank you that despite everything that may be going on around us, we can rejoice and be glad in it. So, God, we thank you for this time we have to open your word. Thank you that you open our hearts, our minds. Help us to focus on you this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Colossians chapter 2. This is our second lesson. I'm, I'm sorry. This is our fifth lesson in our series from Colossians. And the title of the general title is Focus, Don't Get Distracted. Keep your head in the game. Distractions are difficult because you are focused on one thing and something will come. You know how it is sometimes when you hear a, a noise or something and, and you're, you're focused here, but you hear the noise and you turn quickly because you got distracted. Distractions are bad, especially when we're driving. That's why they tell us don't text and drive. Why? Because you can't look at the phone and look at the road and be focused on both of them. And unfortunately, so many times have we seen our eyes get off the road and somebody stops in front of us quicker and we're, we're, we don't realize we've been on that phone a little longer, a few more than just a second, and you crash into the person in front of you. But as believers, we are distracted by a whole lot of things. And I like it as 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Peter writes there, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion sinking whom he may devour. That's from the New King James. The contemporary English version of that verse says, Be on guard and stay awake. Your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion seek, sneaking around to find someone to attack. We, ha we have to always be watching. And tonight's lesson is entitled very simply, Staying Strong Against the Opposition. We're going to have opponents. But... The one thing I know is that when you know trouble is coming, like the graphic in the background, when you know if you lived in an area of hurricanes, or even here in California, we're in earthquake country, we know it's not a matter of if they're going to come, but when they're going to come. If you're in hurricane uh, areas, you know you, how to board up your windows and have the proper precautions and provisions. And, you know, it, unlike an earthquake, I remember several years ago after the 94 earthquake, I had a neighbor across the street, uh, and Nelson was from Cuba. And he had immigrated to Florida, and eventually he and his family made their way to California. And after the quake, Nelson couldn't take it. He packed up and left. I said, but, you know, we said, Nelson, you have... Hurricanes in Florida, he said, but at least I know they're coming. You know, earthquake, you don't, you we know, oh, the big one's coming, the big one's coming, and, and you don't know it's coming until it get here. But a hurricane, you could say, oh, it should land, you know, next Friday. Friday, about six, it should land. I mean, you know how fast it's going. You know the trajectory, how they can uh, forecast how it's coming. But, but, when you know it's coming, you take precautions. We have opponents here in the Christian faith. Th this is from last week, but I, I want to just kind of review just for a minute. We got to watch out. Because, see, there's a danger of those masquerading as believers. But quite frankly, I think they're really deceivers. And others that, that develop these systems that try to put some borders and boundaries over what God has done and, and tell you, as we're going to look in a, a, a little later in this lesson, 
about how you could be better saved. How you could, quite frankly, how could you improve on the work of God? We saw this from Colossians 2, verse 8 and 9 last week. It said from the New King James, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The contemporary English translation says, Don't let anyone fool you by using senseless arguments. These arguments may sound wise, but they are only human teachings. They come from the powers of this world and not from Christ. God lives fully in Christ. As we said, that word cheat has the notion of being kidnapped. Don't let anybody abduct you. Don't let anybody take you captive through empty deceits, traditions, through great arguments that, that you know, they sound good because what do we need to guard against? Again, this is from last week, but I think it bears repeating. What, what, what must I guard against? Against the philosophies that are against or in addition to the elementary teachings of the gospel. Jesus paid it all. And when he purchased our salvation, he just didn't do a down payment. He paid the whole thing. Guard against folks that want you to add something to it. Traditions masquerading as the gospel. We've done it so long, we think, well, you know, the Bible does say cleanliness is next to godliness. If you tell me where it is, I, I, will, I, will, I will give you $1,000. Ready? Because I know it's not there. We have our traditions. We have our customs. Are they right or wrong? No, they're our customs. But they're not gospel. So if another group doesn't adhere to our custom, you think about here at our church, when we have prayer time, we, we break up into groups of two and three. We haven't done it as much during COVID, but, but we're in our small sections. That's our tradition. Now, should every church do it that way? No, they have their own particular way. That's our tradition. I can't say, you're going against the gospel, you know, we should always pray. Well, we pray in, some folks pray in a group. We have a congregational prayer at the end. We don't, uh, church that I grew up in, went to for you. We didn't break up in groups of two and three. It was different when I came here. Right? But that's our preference, ready? And we've got to make sure that we don't have preferences raised to the level of, of scriptural requirements. There's certain things I choose to do, and we're going to look at that in, in a little minute. What must I guard against? Seeking to return to the law. The law was impossible to keep. And that's why Christ came. Galatians 4 said it was our schoolmaster. It, it, it was our tutor to bring us. The law was our, a tool to bring us to Christ. We need to guard against selective adherence to biblical commands. I'm sorry, Scripture is not cut and paste. You can't say, well, I believe in this, but, but you know, I don't want to do that. Because look what it says in verse 10. As we pick up our lesson. Paul writes to the church there. He says, and you are complete in him. He said in verse 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the God, you, you, you're complete in Christ, who's the head of all principality and power. Or as the Revised Standard Version says, and you have come to fullness of life in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. I like that word complete. The, the, the word there, it, it means to make full, to fill up, to cause to abound, to furnish or supply liberally. We, we've been complete, we've been 
furnished with everything we need. See, but Paul says, ready? You are complete in Christ. This is a fact to be enjoyed and not a status to be achieved. I can't work myself up to be complete. No, I'm already complete. That's a fact. I'm not 85% saved. No, I'm 100% saved. Because when we look further, see, here's going to be a battle. Legalism, which is the old way, versus grace, the new way. Is there something I can add to my completeness? We can say yes, because so many people say, I know Christ did this work, but be careful for everything that comes after the but. There's some standards you have to have. You need to do certain things. You, you, you need to honor God. Notice what he says in Colossians 2, verses 11 through 14, and I've highlighted some words in there. He says, starting at verse 11, it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him with baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over it. In him. What about in him? Right? Buried with him. Raised with him. Alive together with him. Right? We, when, we, when we follow the Lord in baptism, right? We, and I don't mean the physical baptism that, that, that we would do in, in, in the baptistry, but, but behind me or wherever we, we may do. No, no. When we, were, when we were baptized, as 1 Corinthians 12 says, we, by one spirit we were all baptized in the body of Christ. When, when we go down, we come up, we're in the body. Right? When Christ, that was a symbolic burial. When Christ went to the tomb, when, when we accept that in him, we were at the tomb. When we were raised with him, we do it by faith. You know, come on, when you get saved, you just don't get a zap. And it's like, oh, everything's new. No, no, I, I, I am born again in my spirit, but my mind has to be renewed. But my old body is still the same. If, 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 if you was overweight before you got saved, you're still overweight. If there's some habits that you like to do, you, what? You had to be renewed. Your body had to get retrained. Your, your flesh is never going to say, well, okay, you got saved, so I'll behave myself. No, it won't. But he's made us alive. That's a positional reality. All, all those requirements... As verse 14 says, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So let me ask you a question this evening. Ready? Was Christ's work on the cross sufficient to meet your spiritual needs? Was Christ's work on the cross sufficient to meet your spiritual needs? Yeah. That is either yes or no. That's not a no with explanation. There is no explanation. 
right? Either you say, Christ, you did it all, or you didn't. There's opposing forces that's going to say, no, you just need to do a little more. Because notice what Ephesians 1, which is a companion letter to Colossians. Notice what it says in verse 7. It says, in him. Now, Paul used in Colossians, he used some of those same in hymns. But in, in verse 7, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He says in verse 11, in him we have attained an, an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Look at verse 13, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of, sal of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in him. Look at uh, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And he says in verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God by faith. Th think about it. You have the forgiveness of sins, as verse 7 of Ephesians 1 says. You've obtained an inheritance. Verse 13 of Ephesians 1 says, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In Philippians, you have your own, you have the righteousness. Having my own righteousness, which is not from the law, but that which is in faith in Christ. I, I, I have a right standing with God. I've got an inheritance. I've been sealed. I've got forgiveness. All that is there, it's available for me not to work for, but to pick it up and run with it. You know, I, my surname is Winston. I did not do anything to be a Winston. I was born a Winston. Why? Because my father was a Winston. Why? His father was a Winston. Why is that? Because his father before him was a Winston. You, you carried that name. I don't have to do anything for it. My birth certificate, they popped out. Mother's name, father's name, father's surname. Just how it is. You take the name of the father. When they put on my birth certificate, Winston. I could change it. Well, I don't want to change it. Why? Because that name means something. See, but there's always going to be people that's going to try to get you to do something a little different. They want to work a little more. It, 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 it's going to feel good to work to get my salvation. And you might be a legalist. See, there, there's an opposition to grace. Because grace, when you really look at it, and that may be a study in and of itself in a lot of time, grace is scary. Because some people equate grace with a license to do anything, and that's, that's not the case. See, these legalists want a strict adherence to the law. We may call them modern-day Pharisees. Because notice what Paul says, starting at verse 16 of Colossians 2. He says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath." which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. 
Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Don't let anybody judge you. I, I like from the J.B. Phillips translation, which is a modern paraphrase, and he's an English writer. So he has a little English take on, 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 on his language. J.B. Phillips writes, in view of these tremendous facts, don't let anyone worry you by criticizing what you eat or drink or what holy days you ought to observe or bothering you over new moons and Sabbaths. All these things have at most only a symbolical value. The solid value is Christ. Nor let any man cheat you of the joy, of your joy in Christ by persuading you to make yourselves humble and fall down and worship angels. Such a man inflated by an unspiritual imagination is pushing his way into matters he knows nothing about and in his cleverness forgetting his head it is from the head alone that the body by natural channels is nourished and built up and grows according to the laws uh, according to God's laws of growth see one writer put it he said, the Old Testament law had certain provisions that are done away with in Jesus regarding such things as food and Sabbath. It isn't that those laws were bad. Simply, they were a shadow of things to come. Once the substance, Jesus Christ, has come, we don't need the shadows anymore. See, see. When you look at it, don't let anyone worry you. Criticizing what you eat or drink. There's some groups, I'm not picking on them. But if you have a ham sandwich, they're going to have a fit. Because the Bible said you're not supposed to have the swine. Don't have no swine, don't have no catfish. Don't have no shrimp, no lobster, no crab. And they want to pull you down, thinking you're less of a Christian. You're not open because we have the laws. Our relationship is based on facts and laws and rules and regulations, and you got to have them. Jesus said, I'm going to go back to the New King James there in verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward by taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding unto those things he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Don't, don't let anybody's system mess you up. See, but, but here's the problem. Legalism creeps in. And we don't like to call it that, but that's what it is. See, I got a 10-question test. Hmm. How to know you might be a legalist? Okay, I'm going to be even uglier. How you know you might be a Pharisee? You might be a legalist if you keep looking down on others, believing yourself to be spiritually superior. I never did that. I've been saved all my life. I, I never went down that path of sin. Come on, you might be a legalist if you are routinely full of hypocrisy and double standards. You're against adultery until your favorite preacher commits adultery and then, well, you know God forgives. You hold a politician, oh, he's a man after God's own heart. Even though he's been divorced, don't go to church, don't know a Bible, haven't seen a Bible, hold it upside down. 
but somebody else who has a different standard taught Sunday school. Well, he can't be used of God. He, he believes you might be a legalist if you hold a double standard. You might be a legalist if you can't accept those whom God accepts. Well, until they clean themselves up, they, they, they ain't got no part here. All that long hair and tattoos and piercings and, oh, no, no. They, they can't be saved looking like that. You might be a legalist if you believe the rules you set for yourself are rules that everyone should follow. We're going to deal with that a little later. You might be a legalist if you are more concerned about outward appearance than inner realities. Come on, when you start saying, don't come into church looking like this. I remember I was at this church this one time, and this one preacher, there was this young lady, she was singing with the choir, uh, and, and you heard the grumbling. And I remember that I, I, I had to admire this man. He said, leave this girl, because her shirt, her skirt was a little shorter than I think some people thought they should have. And you heard the grumblings. You saw the looks. And I remember that this particular pastor, he said, leave her alone. Because some of y'all mad because you couldn't get into that if you had to. Wait, were you more concerned with, oh, she, ha, ha, I saw part of a cleavage. Ha, ha, I can't focus on worship anymore. No, no, no. You Quit looking at her. Close your eyes. Come on. I, yeah, okay, squirm, squirm, squirm. You might be a legalist if you spend more time talking about what you are against, not what you are for. Too often Christians are identified by what they are against. They talk more so about, I'm against sin. I got to preach against sin. No, I don't have to preach against sin. I have to preach for salvation. Folks know they in sin. You ain't got to tell them. You might be a legalist if you make every issue black and white. You don't leave room for gray. Every issue is not black and white. If so, we would all have one church. We would all be member. We are all one church in the body of Christ, but we wouldn't have a different denomination. Why? Because everybody sees things differently. Their government is different. Certain things are, are just, you, they're not wrong. They're different. You might be a legalist if your salvation is based on works and not Jesus. You might be a legalist if you read the Bible to substantiate your own convictions, not to be shaped into God's image. Come on, like as we said earlier, we start picking and choosing. We start cutting and pasting verses. And finally, you might be a legalist if you think these standards, those other nine standards, only apply to others and not you. See, be careful that folks don't cheat you. Because here's the thing. I, I think this is going to help some of you. See, God does have a standard. But it's a broad standard. There's some things, ready, everybody must do. To be in the family of God, you have to receive Jesus into your heart. You can't say, well, I have Jesus, and I have Buddha, and I have Confucius, and I have Muhammad, and, and, and you know, because we just all coexist. No, 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 no. Right? You have to receive Jesus. And when you do that, there's some things that Scripture says we all must do. We're responsible to love one another. We're responsible to forgive one another. Right? We must fellowship together. We must read the word. There's everybody who is a Christian needs to do that. But there are some areas that are not in that blue zone. And that's the green zone. 
what I'm free to do. Right? My freedom in Christ, now I know some of you are going to disagree, but don't turn me off. Just stay with me. Right? I am free to go to the movies. Because there are some folks that say, how can a Christian, you be a Christian, and go see that and, and hear it. I'm free to do that. I'm free to take an alcoholic drink. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine. It does not say, do not drink. And I know some would say, well, if, if you never took a, a drink, you, you would never have to worry about being drunk. That's taking it way over here. There's some things I'm free to do. There are other areas. Quite frankly, ready? I'm free to go to Las Vegas and go have some fun. Will it send me to hell? No. Now, will it be a problem if I say, okay, God, you got to meet, you know, you got to beat my need on, 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 on this machine or, or whatever thing you may play? You're free to do it. The yellow zone, though, ready? It's what I choose to do. Everybody got to do the blue. You're free to do the green. The yellow is what I choose to do. See, I'm in the green area person, personally. Ready? I'm in the green regarding drinking. I'm free to do it. I don't choose to. Is my standard the standard for everybody? No. I don't like the taste. Folks have tried. You say, oh, try this. It's, uh, for me, it's like taking castor oil. Ooh, I did, no, 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 no. Give me a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi. You my friend for life. Right? I choose not to go to scary movies. Now, some folks could... They have no problem with, you know, The Walking Dead, Friday the 13th, or, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to see heads chopped off and blood. No, no, I, I, that's my personal choice. Would I say, no more Christian needs to be seen in the movie theater? But it, no, no, that's my choice. The standard for me is not the same standard for you in those areas that Christians are free to do. See, one of those blue areas, Scripture says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. That's a no. But how many of you know folks, saved Christian folks, they hooked up with somebody who wasn't saved? And sometimes it works out, they stay married, but scriptures don't do that. Right? You may violate that. Because, see, notice what it says Paul wrote in Romans 14. See, this is the principle from Colossians about don't let anybody cheat you with the days that. All that other stuff. Notice what it says in Romans 14. He says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak only eats vegetables. Let him who eats, let him who eats despise him who, de let not him, I knew I was reading that wrong, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received them. Who are you to judge another servant? 
To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will may, be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. He goes on to say in verse 5, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. And verse 13 says, therefore, ready? This is the summation. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. See, remember we said earlier, the law, legalism versus grace, this is grace. And this liberty that you have makes people uncomfortable. See, v v verse, th verse 13 says, don't judge anyone anymore. But make this your goal. I'm not going to put a stumbling block or cause my brother to fall. If there is something I do that's in the green zone, Remember I'll stretch it in the green zone. But I'm around a believer who thinks that's in the blue zone. Love is going to say, I won't do it in your presence. That's not being a hypocrite. It says, when I'm with you, I won't do it. Why? Because I'm stronger in faith, ready? And I can come down to this lower level and stay with you there because you can't deal with it up here. You may think your liberty doesn't in, in, include that and I can make you fall off the wagon spiritually. And that's putting a stumbling block are causing a brother to fall. See, sometimes we have to ask people where they are because everybody's not on the same level. You know, when you get a new believer, I, there, there, there's a situation some time ago with, with, with a person and they, they, had, they had an alcohol problem. And they had gone to rehab. And there was a party that was being held, and the person was going to be there. And somebody asked me about it. I said, put it away. They're going to be there. They're still trying to come out of fully embrace sobriety. And I'm not going to buy into, well, I can't have a good time unless I have something to drink. Get you some water. Why? But as a believer, you gonna help this person to get to the point they say, you know what? It's okay for you. I'm not gonna have it. I have a friend, a, a, a friend of mine. Their spouse had a drinking problem, and he said, you know what? I'm 13 years sober. And I remember him saying, we, we, we were at an event, and he said, you know what, there are some times that I really, I, I really like it. But I, I, but I can't do it. Why? He had grown to the point to say, I, I'm not going to judge you based on my standard. See, go, go back to Colossians because we're, we're going to ask this question. Ready, are you tied up or unlocked? See, the, 
the, the, the, the, the previous verses we read in Colossians 2 had someone cheating on you and, and Paul moves to address those that had some type of asceticism uh, in our relationship with God. What's going to please God and ready? And it's not because of things I don't do. Notice what it says in verse 20. Colossians 2 verse 20. He, he, he says there, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body. But Paul says, but are of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. If you died with Christ, why are you going, why are you going to subject yourself again to these rules? See, because people will tell you, ready, don't break the rules. You know, we, 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 we have got some unwritten church rules. Not picking on anybody, not picking on anybody, but, but former church I, I belong to, there was certain that women were not allowed to wear a pair of pants. And if you came in there, you, first place, I don't think the ushers would let you through the door, but I remember one time, this lady, she was a visitor. You could tell she was a visitor. And she came into church, she, I still remember, she had on this black jumpsuit. Basic that wasn't revealing, wasn't, wasn't you know, stuff hanging out, of, no. She, she, she thought that was okay. But the women around her, they nobody said anything to her. But they mumbled for so long and so loud, quite frankly. Halfway in service, she got up and went to the other side. Why? There's some rules you don't. You, God is bigger than that. Don't, don't do that. See, rules are important, though. Ready? Rules provide boundaries, stability, definition, and focus. Think of the speed limit. Right? There, there, there are certain streets you go down, you can tell, this is a 45 mile zone. When I pass by the school, it's 25 in the schools on why? Because there may be children running up and down and, and, you know, children don't pay attention. They come running across the street. You need to, you can't, you can't go 55. I don't care how big the, 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 the street is, how many lanes in front of the school may have two lanes. In front. You can't say, oh, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm in the far left lane. Kids are going to be, no, no. Bound rules provide boundaries, stability. Parents set boundaries for your kid. A curfew is a rule. It's a boundary. That's why you need to be in by 10 o'clock. Or growing up when you were smaller, you know, some of us who were street-like kids. You were praying in the summertime when those days are longer because in the wintertime, when that street light came on at 5 o'clock, you, you, you still had some play in you. But th 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 those are rules. They were boundaries. But also, ready? Rules can hinder you from growing and maturing because you can follow a rule. But if somebody has set boundaries and you haven't grown to embrace those yourself, when you're not under the rule, I, 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 I know an individual, he had rules from his son. For his son, he was hard. I think he was harsh, quite frankly. He had rules for his son, and, and he never let, he, he told his boy everything he needed to do. The boy went away to college, did not last a semester before he came back on crack. Why? 
Why? Because he didn't learn how to say no. He didn't have dad to say, don't, don't you do that. Don't you? Why? He had the rules. But he didn't grow to where he knew the reason to embrace that rule. Thirdly, it's possible to keep the letter of the rule, but not the spirit of the rule. You kept it, but you're grumbling about it. You resent it. Well, if I had to choose, I wouldn't pick that, but I'll do it. And you know how folks, but they don't want to do But see, rules can also appear to lead to godliness. But they really don't. But they only feed pride and self-indulgence. I keep these. I don't do that. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't chew. I don't mess with those that do. God loves me. Notice what the Apostle Paul said to the church of Galatians, Galatians 5. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. This is from the New Living Translation. And don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with, with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Why? There's no outward appearance that I can do to make me right. Even though you read in the Old Testament when he, God gave this command to Abraham, to the Jews, and if you say, oh, I'm going to do it, so I'll be right with God. No, Paul said you're making Christ of no benefit. Why? Because yeah, you can do that. But then you got to keep everything. And Scripture lets us know you can't keep everything. You have to say, Christ, you set me free. I'm going to embrace you. Notice what it says in Galatians 6, 12, and 13. He kind of picks it up again. He says, those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want you to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciple. See, we have to know there's going to be opposition to you being free. See, because there's a benefit some people have by you being in slavery, if nothing else, by just saying, ha ha, look what I did to them. Christ has set us free. We don't have to be judged anymore with what we eat, what we drink, where we go. But we walk, ready, in a liberty that we want to please God in everything we do. There's some things that you may not do because you say, God, I don't think that's going to please you in my life. Somebody else may be okay to do it. But you say, you know what? No, I'm going to honor God this way. I'm going to give you a, a specific example. Ready? My wife, quite frankly, does not pump gas in her car. For 32 years, I have got gas 
in her car. Can she do it? Yes, she can do it. When I've gone away on trips, I, I try to judge it and to make sure the night before I go, I make sure her car is filled up so she doesn't have to get gas during the week. Those times that I've gone more than a week, I say, okay, here, go to this station, get filled. She, she can do it. But that's how I am honoring her. I make sure it's gassed up, it's washed, it's maintained. Other husbands don't do that. A couple of times I've been at the gas station and I've seen these women struggling with the gas pump. And here, let me help you. Let me help you. In the back of my mind, I want to say, where's your no good husband? Until I realize, no, that's a standard that I've set for me. Is it a rule that every man should have in his marriage? No. But that's one I have for me. See, there's some things in my marriage, in my life, in my relationship with you. I said, God, I'm going to honor you this way. Someone else may not do it that way. But that's between them and you. I'm not going to intrude and put my standard on you. See, God wants us to walk, as it says in Scripture, in the liberty wherewith you've been called. And when you walk how God has called you, you will have an enjoyable Christian life. You'll be, you don't have to be in fear or in shame. But you can present, say, God, this is my offering to you. I'm going to stop right there. Next week, next week, we'll go to Colossians 3. And our title will be, Set Your Mind on Things Above. We need to stay out of the valley and go to the mountaintop. So I invite you to join me again next week. If you'd like a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, please email me at cornell.h.winston at gmail.com, and I will gladly uh, forward it to you. Uh, some information that's there that you may want to take notes on it, uh, and also however you do it, we make yourself available to you. Also, we're going to invite you, not only for Wednesday night, this online Bible study, but also invite us here. We are in person on Sunday mornings at 8 and 10. We're at 27754 Church Street, uh, 5 Freeway, exit Parker Road, turn left, uh, go to Corona, turn right, and you'll see our church on the right-hand side, uh, 27754 Church Street. We invite you still. If you can't make it in our area, we're still available online. But we, everything we do is, number one, designed to lift high the name of Jesus. And also to make sure that you're edified as you grow in the Lord. So you're invited. Join us on Wednesdays as well as Sunday mornings at 8 and 10. Again, God bless you. Thank you for joining me. So glad, so glad that you tuned in this evening. I hope you've been blessed. hope you've been strengthened. hope you've been edified. Also, let, let me also say this. If you have questions, that same email address. Let me go back to it. Cornell.h.winston at gmail.com. You could shoot me a question because sometimes, unfortunately, in this online atmosphere, I, I can't receive your, your, your questions as you have them. But you may have a question, and maybe I could answer it in next week's study, or you could put it in the chat there on YouTube or Facebook. I go back and check those uh, during the week just to, just to make sure if you have a question, because I'm here to help you grow. And that's what I want for you. So if you have questions, you can email me or write it in the chat, and I'll do my best uh, to answer. Again, God bless you. God keep you. Thank you again for joining this evening. Let's bow as we conclude. Thank you, O oh God, again for this time that we had in your word. Father, we pray that you just seal this word in our hearts. Lord, help us to walk in that liberty 
that freedom that you have for us. Thank you, O oh God, that when you died, we died. When you were raised, we were raised. And thank you, O oh God, for just the marvelous things that you are doing in each and every one of our lives. I pray, O oh God, that you would just return this time back to these children of yours again. Return this time with a better life, a more productive life. Lord, thank you that when we commit ourselves to grow in you, you meet us at the point of our need. Bless this church. Continue to help us to reach this valley wherever our sphere of influence may go. Father, we thank you how you loved us, how you care for us. We count it a privilege, oh God, to be in your family. Bless this time. Keep us in your care and allow us the privilege to return to your house of worship at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. Have a great evening. Lord willing, see you again next week.